بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم اللهم افتح لنا فتوح الآرفين ووفقنا توفيق الصالحين وانفعنا بالقرآن والذكر الحكيم اللهم انفعنا بما علمنا وعلمنا بما ينفعنا وزدنا علما يكاربنا منك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا سهلا اللهم عيذنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأصلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونسوب إليك وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعليه وصحبه وسلم وبارك في غالب مولف الإمام النووي رحمه الله ونفعنا به وبكم الحديث الثاني Inshallah, continuing on the study of the Imam Nawawi's 40 hadith. We're looking today at the hadith number two. And uh, just uh, as the introduction has just reminded me to mention a couple of things based on that. Uh, you may have noticed that I studied with different shayukh. Uh, and this is actually a sunnah of our early salaf. Now, when they studied Islam, they studied with different shayukh, different ulama. It's, it's because why? Because of course, different ulama will have different specialities. Yeah? One, one may specialize in hadith, one may specialize in tasawwuf, one may specialize in Quran. So if you want to get the best uh, knowledge of the deen, you should sit with different ulama and different shayukh. Sometimes we see brothers having a fanatic attachment to a, their particular shaykh, for example, etc. Um, that's not actually from our sunnah of, this, uh, of our salaf, you know, how, how they went, like, you know, all of the great scholars, you see, they went from different cities, they studied with the best scholars of different cities, uh, to get uh, the knowledge of the deen. And there's, there's a deep wisdom in this because um, we're, we're a community of ijma. We're a community of ijma consensus. Something very important actually, a concept of consensus that we have to study carefully. Because there's many strong proofs. Uh, and in fact, the scholars of al Sunnah wal Jama'ah they said that the proofs for ijma consensus are qat'i. They are de definitive. They're at the level of being definitive, meaning they're at the same strength as we find uh, uh, from the Quran or from the mutawatir hadith, that those hadith which have come through multiple sahaba, are called mutawatir, they're the strongest category of hadith. So what do we mean by ijma? Because the, you know, as, uh, there's many hadith and many of the great sahaba as well have many statements regarding the fact that this Ummah is protected from deviance and uh, error. La tajtami'u ummati ala dalala is one hadith of the Prophet This Ummah will never gather upon uh, error. And also in a Sahih hadith in Al-Bukhari and others, the Prophet mentioned that there will always be from this Ummah a group that is upon the haqq, upon the truth. So the meaning of that is the same as uh, the meaning of the other hadith. If you think about it, if there will always be a group upon the truth, that also means that we can never agree upon error. The Muslims will never agree upon something which is wrong. Because there, there is always a group that would have the haqq, you see. So this is the concept of ijma, consensus. So that's how, you know, the, 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 there's a divine protection on this ummah. There's a divine protection on this ummah. They, we will never, the Muslims will never agree upon something which is incorrect or wrong, whether that be in aqidah or fiqh or in any aspect of the deen. So it's very important. That's, that's, so that's one of the blessings of studying with different people, is to try to find the consensus. Any particular alim may have some opinions which may be but incorrect. We don't believe that the ulama 
the shaykh are ma'asum, infallible. That's the, that's the realm of the prophets. So these are just a bit slight, some slight um, <coughs> extremes that we find, do find. Uh, you know, some Muslim. And one of the things I thank my teachers for, they didn't teach us that type of extreme. Uh, you know, people like Sheikh Hamza Yusuf, they said, you know, whatever good you learn from me, take it. Whatever you don't find good, then, you know, it's from my own deficiencies. Uh, and that's, if you look at it, actually that's the way of the Salaf. Even the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who the Quran said, وَمَا يَنْتِقُوا عَلِي الْحَوَىٰ He doesn't speak from his own desires. إِنَّمَا هُوَ وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ It is nothing but revelation, what he speaks. But, despite that, in the Battle of Badr, we know, when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was arranging strategy, one of the Sahaba asked him, Ya Rasulullah, is this from Wahi? Or is this from your own sort of thinking, your own strategy? You know, so think about that question. This is, was asked to the Prophet And he actually said, no, this is just from my own idea, my own strategy for this, you know. So then the Sahabi then gave his own opinion. So, you know, we can't, we don't, shouldn't forget this. So sometimes now you see people, if, they, if their Sheikh says something, it's like what he has descended. Whereas even we know the Sahaba were not afraid to even give opinions to the Prophet ﷺ, who the Quran said, وَمَا يَنْتِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ Because they said to him, is this from Wahi or is this your strategy? In other words, if it is Wahi, we submit. We have no say, the Sahaba have no say in the matter, if it is from Wahi. And look at Sayyidina Umar one of the greatest, the second greatest of all the Sahaba, the Prophet said, if there was a Nabi after me, he would have been Omar. But look at, uh, look at the attitude of the Muslims that were around him. One day he said, no, Omar stood on the minbar and he said, if you see me going wrong, what would you do? One man from the crowd took out his sword above his head and he said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, we will straighten you with this. So, you know, if, if that's, the Sahaba, they didn't, you know, they didn't go, they didn't go to say Omar and say, whatever you say is like wahi, we don't, you know, so. This is quite important for Muslims to be aware, yes, we must respect our teachers, we respect our shiyukh. We have full respect for the knowledge, and if we don't have knowledge, we, you know, we accept what they say. But Islam has never been uh, about uh, just a blind submission as well. One day Sayyidina Umar anhu, when he was Khalifa, he, he stood on the memory, he gave fatwa, he said, because he felt that the mahar, the mahar, the dowry, was getting too high in Medina. When the Muslims had started becoming wealthy, all the riches of Rome and Persia were coming into Medina. The Muslims were becoming wealthy. He felt that the mahar was becoming too high for the women in Medina. And he said he wanted to put a limit. So he said, uh, there will be a limit. You can't have uh, more than this amount, X amount. Now what happened? Actually a sister, a woman stood up from amongst the crowd. And she challenged him. She said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran, Allah said in the Quran regarding women, if you have given them a qintar, meaning a huge treasure, a huge amount of dowry, mahar, don't take it back from them. So she said, how can you limit the mahar when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran said, qintar, a huge treasure. And Sayyidina Umar immediately backed, or backed back from his fatwa. He immediately retracted his fatwa. And he said, what did he say? He said, even a woman, uh, even a normal woman in Medina has got more knowledge than Omar. So this was the attitude of the Muslims towards, you know, the, towards the great Sahaba. There's, there's respect, there's love. 
But at the same time, uh, it's very dangerous if we switch off our aql, because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us the aql as one of the greatest gifts that is given to human beings. So our job is to seek the knowledge of the deen, gain more and more knowledge of the deen, sit respectfully with our teachers and take the knowledge from them. Uh, but we shouldn't be afraid to ask questions as well. So I ask Allah to reward my teachers who gave me this understanding of Islam. Hadith number two is a famous hadith in, in which the Prophet and Umar anhu قال, this is from Sayyidina Umar who said, بينما نحن جلوس عند رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ذات يوم اذتلع علينا رجل شديد بياض الثياب شديد سواد الشعر لا يرى عليه أثر الصفر ولا يعرفه منا أحد حتى جلس إلى النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم فأسند ركبته إلى ركبته ووضع كفيه على فخذه so, so <coughs> this famous hadith known as the hadith of Jibreel took place at the time very close to the end of the life of the Prophet وسلم, uh, on this earth. Very close to the end of his time amongst the Sahaba. Now, so that, that, that accounts for the importance of the hadith. Uh, so Sayyidina Umar was sitting with the Prophet وسلم, with some other Sahaba and he said, while we were sitting, uh, one day a man with extremely white clothing came upon us. And he had extremely black hair. We could see no trace of journey upon him. So this was very unusual because he's someone that was a strange person, so he's not from Medina, because obviously in those days people knew everyone. They say he's a strange person, but he doesn't have any signs that he's been through a journey. But he suddenly appeared from nowhere, dressed in bright white and dark black hair. So there was, you know, quite, quite, uh, quite a um, unusual occurrence. None of us knew who he is. So where does he come from? Who is this person? He must have come from a journey, but we can't see any trace of journey on him. And then he sat in front of the Prophet and he said he attached his knees to his knees. So he was sitting in front of the Prophet and his, their knees were in contact. And he placed his hands upon his knees. And, uh, according to most commentators it means upon his own knees. Placed hands upon his own knees. Although it's not very clear, it could, could also mean the other. وَقَالَ يَا Muhammad. He said, يَا Muhammad. أَخْبِرْنِي عَنِ الْإِسْلَامِ Tell me about Islam. فَقَالَ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ الْإِسْلَامُ وَتَشْهَنَا أَنْ لَا إِلَهِ إِلَى اللَّهِ وَأَنَّ مُحَمَّدًا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ وَتُقِيمَ الصَّلَاةِ وَتُعْتِي الزَّكَاءَ وَتَصُومَ رَمَضَانَ وَتَحُجَّ الْبَيْتَ إِنْ اسْتَطَعْتَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلَ Islam is that you believe in Allah, you believe that there is no God except for Allah. You believe that Muhammad is the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa You establish the prayer, you give the zakah, you fast Ramadan, and you make hajj if you are able to. If you are able to. قَالَ صَدَقْتَ فَعَجِبْنَ لَهُ يَسَلُهُ وَيُصَدِّقُهُ Now the strange thing then happened, the man, he said, Sadaqta, you have spoken truly. So the Sahaba were surprised, you know, how come someone can ask the Prophet on this question and then when he gives an answer he says, you spoke correctly. But look at the Adab, you know, they, they remained silent, he's sitting there, you know, and didn't say anything, but they just look feeling very surprised at what's happening. So then he said, tell me what is Iman? قَالَ أَنْ تُؤْمِنَ بِاللَّهِ وَمَلَائِكَتِهِ وَكُتُبِهِ وَرُسُولِهِ وَالْيَوْمَ الْآخِرِ وَتُؤْمِنَ بِالْقَدْرِ خَيْرِهِ وَشَبِهِ He says that you believe in Allah, 
and his malaika and his books and his messengers and the day of judgment and you believe in the predestination the good and the bad qala sadaqta once again the man said you speak, spoke truthfully and so they were surprised but they still remained silent qala fa akhbirni an al ihsan then the man said tell me what is ihsan excellence قال تعبد الله كأنك تراه فإن لم تكن تراه فإنه يراك The Prophet said that you worship Allah as if you see him and if you do not see him then surely he sees you قال فأخبرني عن الساعة He said then tell me about the hour the last hour the day of judgment قال ما المسؤول عنها بعالم من السائل The Prophet said, the one who is questioned does know, doesn't know anything more than the questioner. So then the man said, tell me about the signs, the signs of the last day. So the Prophet ﷺ then gave two signs, two signs of the Day of Judgment. The first one he said, the slave girl will give birth to her mistress. And the second one he said, you will see, you will see barefooted, half naked, well, it says naked, but it's, you know, it says half naked, um, shepherds. Shepherds, poor shepherds, uh, competing in building tall buildings. Then the man left. Now look at the adab of the Sahaba once again. They didn't speak. They they remained sitting with the Prophet وسلم, and that was the uh, practice of Sahaba. When they sat with the Prophet ﷺ, they didn't ask him questions upon questions upon questions. They would remain silent and if he spoke, then they would benefit from what he said. And if he didn't speak, they would sit silently or, you mentioned the hadith, they would, they would just talk amongst themselves and the Prophet ﷺ would sit and listen to them. But when he spoke, they would be absolutely silent and so still as if birds could be sitting on their heads. But they didn't ask him many questions, you know, they didn't ask a lot of questions. They used to get very happy when a Bedouin or someone came from outside of Medina and started asking the Prophet ﷺ questions. They used to get happy because now, you know, they could hear the answers that were given. Um, and once again, this is part of the adab of studying the sacred knowledge. For students of sacred knowledge, it's best not to ask lots of questions when you're sitting with your teachers. You just you study step by step through different texts and you gain your you build up your knowledge slowly. If you just start asking firing lots of questions from all directions, you will never get through your systematic study of the dean. So often students of knowledge as well, when we sit with our teachers, we don't ask too many questions and we get happy when someone comes who's not a student of knowledge, just a normal person and he starts asking questions to the Sheikh because that then allows uh, you to benefit as well. Uh, so then the man left and said, no, Omar said, I sat along so, so for some time. And then eventually the Prophet ﷺ said, ثم قال, Ya Omar, atadri man is sa'il. Oh Omar, do you know who the questioner was? Qultu Allahu wa Rasuluhu Adam. He said, I, Allah and his messenger know best. So you see here, There's no question of any type of shirk in these type of statements. You know, Allah and His Messenger know best. If this was not said by the great Sahaba, people today would probably have accused us of shirk for saying something like that. Yeah, but no, of course not. This is how the Sahaba used to speak to the Prophet 
and there is no question of any type of shirk involved. Allah and His Messenger know best. When the Prophet used to call them, they used to say, Fidaka Abi wa Ummi, Ya Rasulullah. May my mother and father be sacrificed for you, O Messenger of Allah. No question of any type of shirk. This is just a normal respect that you show to the Messenger of Allah. So, Qala fa innahu Jibreel atakum yu'allimukum deenakum. He said, this was Jibreel, he came to teach you your deen. Ruahu Muslim, narrated by Muslim, is Sahih, and mentioned in other books as well. But it's sufficient for Imam Nawawi to say Muslim here, because of those books, obviously Bukhari and Muslim have got a special status. Uh, you know, if the hadith is there, he doesn't need to mention all the other books that they are mentioning, but it is mentioned in other books as well. So this then, you know, the final statement shows us the importance of the hadith itself. That actually this man was Jibreel. Now this is quite amazing because normally uh, Sahaba, they didn't see Jibreel a.s. Normally it's not easy for someone to see a malak, an angel, with their eyes. You know, very difficult. In fact, you know, once uh, it's narrated that Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet he was saying to the Prophet please let me see Jibreel. I want to see Jibreel. And the Prophet was actually saying to him, no, you can't, you won't be able to. You know, but because he was his uncle and one of the most beloved people to him, you know, because don't forget Al-Abbas and Hamza, they were both uncle of the Prophet but they actually, they were the similar age to him. So they had grown up together and so they were very, very close. And he insisted on him, you know, uh, show me. So then the Prophet said to Jibreel, uh, you know, show yourself to my uncle. And when Jibreel showed himself, uh, Al Abbas fainted. And he fainted because of the vision of a malak. It's not something easy for a human being. So this is why the prophets normally, they're able to see uh, uh, malaika. So, but, so this shows, you know, this, this hadith took place at the, towards the end of the time of the Prophet ﷺ amongst the Sahaba. And these great Sahaba was there, Sayyidina Umar. So they've seen now Jibreel, you know, he's come and he's, he's, he's asked these questions. And the Prophet ﷺ furthermore, he said, يُعَلِّمُكُمْ دِينَكُمْ He came to teach you your deen. Your deen. What's a deen? Deen is Islam. So this means that within this hadith is, is covered all the main areas of our deen. So that's why so it's such an important hadith. Because first of all, it's, it's covering all of the areas of our deen, summarizing them, and secondly, because it happened towards the end of the time of the Prophet ﷺ, um, shows us that this was the completion of the deen as well. So let's look at uh, in more detail, inshallah, the various questions that were asked and the answers that were given. What time did we start? Uh, anyone know the time when we started? We started half past eleven. The class is for 45 minutes, so inshallah, we will uh, finish on time and then we can carry on next tomorrow, inshallah, if we need to. <coughs> the first question was what is Islam? So the Prophet mentioned the five. But can, you know, five pillars believe that uh, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is message of Allah so Allah um, said <clears throat> and the five pillars of Islam so this is what we call this is what we study under the science of fiqh this is what we study under the science of fiqh which is to do with these five pillars how do we pray, how do we uh, do salah, how do we do zakah, etc. So this is the outward practices that we have to carry out. The second question he asked, what is the iman? He said, to believe in Allah and his malaika and his books and his messengers and the day of judgment and the qadr, the good and the evil. So the iman, the belief so actually, Islam comes before Iman. 
Islam is a level and Iman is a higher level. This is very clearly actually mentioned also in the Quran, in the Surah Al-Hujurat. When some of the Bedouins, they came to the Prophet and they had just become Muslim. And they said, Amanna, we believe, you know, we believe in this, this religion. And uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in Surah Al-Hujurat, La taqulu amanna, don't say you believe. But say, qulu aslamna, say you have submitted, you have become Muslim. In other words, yes, you are now doing the outward practice, you are doing the prayer, you are paying the zakah, but Iman has not entered your hearts. That's what the Quran says. Uh, that Iman has yet, not yet entered into their hearts. So this is a clear indication that Islam and then Iman is the higher stage. Iman is when we truly believe in uh, these things of the ghayb. Uh, so these aspects are also come right at the beginning of the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem Alif la mim dhalika al-kitab la rayba fi hudan lil muttaqeen alladhina yu'minuna bil ghayb They believe in the unseen. So this is the iman part, you know, we believe in the unseen. What does it mean unseen? means things we can't see with our own eyes. The greatest of that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. You know, in this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is in the unseen for us. Even though he is a zahir al batin, in a way he ta he's not in the unseen, in a way he's zahir al batin, he is manifest and hidden, but uh, he's because this is our Iman, because if he was not hidden in this world, if he was not in the ghayb, there would be no question of Iman. Everyone would believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There would be no test, there would be no question. You know, if everyone saw Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, there's no, there's no question of some people being believers and some people being kufar. So this is why in this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is الَّذِينَ يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْغَيْبِ وَيُقِيمُونَ الصَّلَاةِ وَمِمَّا رَزَقْنَاهُمْ يُنْفِقُونَ they establish the prayer and they spend of what we have given them, in other words, zakat and extra sadaqah. So then Islam is there in, in the right at the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah. Iman and then Islam is mentioned, these practices. Uh, and there comes Ihsan as well. Yuqinun, they have got yaqeen, they have got certainty in the akhirah, in the next world. So we can see a parallel between that and the first few ayahs of Surah Al-Baqarah. So this is Islam, the, the, the practice of the deen. Now, you know, we have to remember, you know, as I mentioned yesterday about <coughs> We need to remind people what it means to be human beings. Uh, a, few, couple, few, a couple of weeks ago I had a dream of one of my teachers saying that to me in a dream. That we have to remind people what it means to be human beings. I, I mean, I don't, I'm not really, I don't always like think I have true dreams or anything like that, but I felt just from reflecting upon that, uh, it was a true statement the dream because this is this is what uh, is being lost in our current age we don't know what it actually means to be human beings anymore now to, to be a human being is not to practice these five pillars of Islam that's not what it means to be a human being if we look at the earliest surahs of Quran when the Prophet ﷺ was in Mecca Look at the first wahi that was coming down. What was it saying? What were the first surah saying? Were they saying Psalm Ramadan? Were they talking about Zakat? Were they talking about Hajj? No. These things came in later on. What were the earliest surahs talking about? About belief in Allah, about belief in the Day of Judgment, and then also about aspects of social justice. 
the earliest surahs, you know. About feeding the miskin. La tuhaduna ala ta'amal miskin. You don't look after the, the poor people in your society. You don't look after the orphans. The people who have got no parents to look after them, no father to look after them in your society, you don't look after them. These were the first things that Islam was teaching. The first things. You know, before any of these other things. This is actually what it means to be a human being. This is what it means to be a human being that we've forgotten. The Muslims and Islam is a deen that if we have true, if we have the true deen, it's not about just, you know, uh, I do my salah and I do, I do my fasting. Of course, that's a great thing, you know, and the salah is, is the pillar of the deen. And the fasting as well is a great purification, especially uh, nowadays when we have such a long fast. And I sincerely congratulate all of you and myself for doing these fasts of such long hours. Because it is a, is a really great purification, inshallah ta'ala. And one of the great secret and blessings of uh, Ramadan, why, why the hadith said that all actions have got reward, but fasting is specially for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he, only he will give the reward. Why? Because one of the secret and wisdom of that Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah pointed out, is because the fasting of Ramadan actually is, a, is a, an ibadah, which it is very difficult to have any riya or shirk in it. Any type of showing off. Remember yesterday we talked about showing off and shirk. Think about that, you know, because you're doing such a strong, long ibadat, but there's no showing off because all the Muslims are doing it at the same time. There's even children that are doing the fast. You know, how can I have any showing off when my own daughter, alhamdulillah, my daughter is 14, she's fasting. So how can I... No, how can we, so this is a why, actually it's a great blessing, Ramadan. It's a great, great blessing because it's a very, very strong ibadah. Because it's a, it's a, a psalm is continuous, you know. From the moment you wake up to the moment of iftar, you're going to continuously feeling that hunger and thirst. You know? So it's a continuous ibadah, but you're safe from riya as well. So it's, there's a lot of ikhlas there because you're only doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you wanted, you could sneak off and eat and drink something. No one going to see you. Yeah, so the people who are keeping the fast, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, accept our fasting from us. This is important, but what I'm trying to say to you is Islam. If we get to the true core of this teaching, it's not just about these aspects because we have to look at the early... Revelation, the early surahs of Quran that came in Mecca, they were giving the, the principles of this deen. Why is this religion different from what was happening already? The Mushrikeen. Why? Because the Sahaba, they were now saying, no, we have to take care of the orphans within the society. We have to take care of the poor people. We have to feed them. It's our responsibility. We can't have the old system of tribalism, nationalism, just because I'm from a wealthy, a strong family, I will be looked after. But if I don't have a strong family, I will be, you know, oppressed. No. Islam demands justice, social justice. So this is very important for us to, to remember this. And, and it's something that we're losing, you know, in, in the time, day and age we live in, because the powerful forces in the world today, the powerful forces which are not Muslim forces, they are very happy to have Muslims who are going to do their ibadat, their prayer and their fasting, they, they will let you build big masjids. Yeah, but as long as you don't challenge their oppression and their injustice that they're perpetrating around the world, because it's a global, it's now a global order. It's a global government almost. You know? we're, and we're not saying this, they themselves are, pro are proclaiming this. 
new world order, as they call it. We didn't, uh, we didn't say that. They said it themselves. They're, they're telling us we have got a new world order. This is a global economic system. This is a global uh, you know, government. The first person to announce that publicly was George Bush Sr., if anyone remembers him, when they had the first Gulf War. And they got all the different countries together to go and bomb Baghdad. One of the greatest cities of the Muslim world, which we've forgotten our own history. They bombed Baghdad and they showed us on our television screens how they were bombing Baghdad and we were sitting there eating our, our, eating our biryanis and watching it on television at the same time. So we've forgotten our history. So then he, they, that's the first time he, they proclaimed, George Bush Sr., on, on the television, we are now seeing the emergence of a new world order. And it was secondarily then proclaimed again by Gordon Brown, the Prime Minister of this country, if anyone remembers him. He's probably not a very memorable person, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if you can't remember who I'm talking about. At the time when, after the banking crisis, when they got all the leaders of the world together in France, and they made these plans of how we're going to sort out the world economy, which is on the verge of collapse. And Gordon Brown once again triumphantly declared, yeah, we're seeing, look at this new world order we have, you know, how we can get all the nations of the world together. So these are the powerful forces at work. They're very happy with a Muslim who is confined to his ibadat. But they won't be happy with a Muslim who is embracing the core teachings of this deen of social justice. You know, that we can't ignore what's happening to people around the world. Whether they be Muslim or non-Muslims. People who are being oppressed under this global order. People who are starving. You know, where there's surplus of food around the world, but people are still starving. Where wealthy people are living in huge luxuries and giving massive uh, million dollar weddings in uh, Islamabad, whereas the people there around the country are just starving of not having food to eat. So Islam doesn't accept this, he can never accept that. So we have to, you know, get embraced back to our deen and the teaching of this deen in a deep way. So that's Islam and then Iman, the Prophet ﷺ mentioned to believe in Allah. If there was, if Allah was, uh, so I mentioned that already, to believe in the Malaika and the books, so we believe in all the books that came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran is the final revelation which has not been changed, the previous revelations have been changed, but it's quite interesting if you compare the stories of the Prophets in the Quran and you look at the Bible for example, there's quite a lot of similarities, like the, the story of Musa alayhi salam. If you look at that in the Quran and you look in the Bible, there's a, probably 80%, 90% concordance. So it does show us actually that those revelations are still quite intact. But we know for sure they have been changed and corrupted, so we can't really be reliant upon them. We can't be sure of what has been changed and what is still... The only way we know is if it was verified by the Quran or the Prophet ﷺ, then we know that it is correct from the previous scriptures. And we believe in all of the messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think if we reflect upon this actually, it's a great a strengthening of our iman. You know that the Prophet ﷺ didn't just come from nowhere. He didn't just come out of the blue and come with something completely new. You know, actually this is a, this is a very, uh, you know, something I've, I've looked into and thought about. It's very strengthening for our iman that we see the previous prophets and the same teachings that came before from Musa alayhi salam, Isa alayhi salam, we still have those books, you know, the, the, the Old Testament and all of that, that they're teaching there's one God, there's a day of judgment, there's Malaika. This is a great boost to our Iman actually, that, you know, the Prophet was the end of a chain 
he didn't bring something new. He came simply to verify the previous teachings and to correct those things that had been changed from the previous teachings. And it's amazing if we look at the fact, the historical fact, that there were so many Jews in Medina. There were three Jewish tribes living in Yathrib. What were they doing there? What were these Jews doing living in Yathrib? It was the name of Medina before the, before the time of Islam was known as Yathrib. Why was there so many Jews living in Yathrib? You know, have we ever reflected upon this? And living in Arabia nearby, in Khaybar and these places. Why? They were there for a reason. They were there because they knew the final prophet is going to come to that town. They knew that the final prophet that is going to come is going to come to that particular town. That's why they had come there and settled there. They were waiting for him. And they used to boast to the Arabs. They used to boast to the Arabs, soon the final prophet is going to come. And when he comes, we're going to take over all of you. Lord. Why? Because they assumed that he was going to come from the Jewish race. That was the incorrect assumption that they had. Because they forgot that Ibrahim al-Islam had another son, Ismail. That didn't cross their mind, you see. So it's, it's very strengthening for our Iman to reflect upon these facts that, you know, there was a whole historical build-up to the, to the Prophet ﷺ coming. They knew because the Quran says, يَعْرِفُونَ هُوْ كَمَا يَعْرِفُونَ أَبْنَاءَهُمْ These Jews, they know this Prophet ﷺ as just like they know their own sons. They had the full description about him. A lot of it they hid in late, and a lot of it has been lost. You know, and a lot of it they hide till today. Information they had. They had not only information about the Prophet, they had also descriptions about his two khulafa, Sayyidina Omar and Sayyidina Abu Bakr. They had all of this uh, knowledge, you know. Because, uh, you know, the few of them that did convert, like Abdullah ibn Salam, he told, they told the Muslims. You know, we have all these descriptions, we have this information. So that's why the Quran said, Ya Rifuna Hukama Ya Rifuna Abna'ahum. They know him, they know the Prophet just like they know their own sons. And in fact, one of them said, we know him better than our own sons. Because in our own son we might have a doubt. You know, maybe my wife uh, was cheated on me. Yeah? So they had a full, they knew exactly who he is. And you know the story about the three questions they asked him as well. When they, the, the, the Quraysh came from Mecca to, to Medina, because they said to the Jewish rabbis, you know, you people have got knowledge of the, 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 the books and you people have got knowledge of the prophets. We don't know much about this. How can we find out if Muhammad is, is, uh, is telling the truth, that his claim is true? So those Jewish scholars, they gave them three questions. Go and ask him these three questions. Because no one but a prophet can answer these three questions. So they came back to Mecca and they asked the prophet, Sallallahu and I won't go into the full story, but then after a period of time, Jibreel came and gave the answers to these three questions and it's recorded as a revelation of the Quran. So this is something, uh, you know, to believe in, not just, we don't just believe in the Prophet, we believe in the messengers before him. That's the beauty of this Ummah, the great honor that this Ummah has been given with the final community. You know, it's said by some of the scholars that on the Day of Judgment, there will be some Prophets that will have no followers. You know, there are some prophets that have no followers. And it will be the Ummah of Sayyidina Muhammad Sallallahu that will testify for them. We will be the Ummah that will testify for them that they, they were a true prophet from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Because we believe in all of the prophets and messengers. Uh, inshallah, we'll leave it there. Tomorrow, inshallah, we'll finish off the um, explanation of this particular hadith. So of course, it's such a, such a huge hadith that we can't... You know, we could spend the next 10 days because it actually covers all the teaching of the deen. But inshallah, we'll try and finish it tomorrow and then move on to hadith number three. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our teaching and our studying. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to accept our prayers, our taraweeh, our fasting, qira'atul quran, our i'tikaf. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give tawfiq to the brothers who are arranging the affairs of this masjid. May Allah... Increase them and may Allah give tawfiq to all the rest of the community to help them in their, in their righteous endeavors that they are taking place. 
جز الله عنا سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ما أهله جز الله عنا سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ما أهله جز الله عنا سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم ما أهله سبحان ربي ترى بالعزة عما يصفون 